Parrots, you know, usually in Europe, in zoos, they are, they have a chain linking to their... <laughs> so, <laughs> we are in the good tradition. Now, is this all right? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, I think first of all, I should re remind you of a few points. Maybe you also remember, which I said, generally speaking, about epics. Since I don't have my paper here, could somebody remind me? A long poem, yes. Yeah. Uh, epic is a long narrative poem on a grand Thank you very much. Now, uh, in Asluziadas of by Camões, you would think that we don't have, uh, because this is a 16th, end of 16th, he composed uh, the Luziadas between 1655, 1671, more or less. And he died, I think, in, uh, no, 15, I'm sorry, 1571. He published it in 1571. And he died, uh, perhaps, four years later in Portugal. So, uh, one would think that 16th century Iberian literature, I'm saying Iberian because in 16th century things were not clear. Portuguese themselves, they were not very clear about their own language, neither were the Castilians, neither, uh, and I'll show you, uh, a map of uh -oh. this is a map of Spain, including Portugal. I mean, if the Portuguese people would listen to me, they might be not very happy. <laughs> but you see, in 16th century, um, Spain was hardly liberated of uh, so-called Arabic dominion. I say so-called because the, the Arabs who conquered, I don't say invade, I say conquered. There were never so many as to be able to invade. So they conquered Spain and they had a caliphate from eighth, beginning of eighth century up to 12th century. And then after that, gradually, uh, the so-called Christian kingdoms, because their religion was very doubtful very often, you know. 
they advanced and up to Northern Africa in 16th century. So the political situation in 16th century was very unstable. At the death of Camões in, seven, in 1674, if I'm not wrong, tomorrow I shall give you a more precise uh, life of Camões because it is so much linked with the Lusiadas. Uh, when he died around seven, 1674, at that very moment, the Spanish army was invading complete the whole of Portugal. And for 60 years, I say 60 years, Portugal was part of Spain under Philip II. And the Portuguese colonies were also part of Spanish colonies. So there was a, a great uncertainty before that. Uh, Portugal had already to battle, you know, with the powerful neighbors, with the so-called Arabs. Most of them were Berber. Do you know? Who is a Berber? Berber are the native populations of northern Africa, even during Roman times. And their languages is somehow akin to Hebrew and Old Arabic, but it is quite different. To this day, I say to this day, most of this part are Berber speaking as well as Arabic. Hmm? And in, from immemorial times, there was a go, going, and, throw, going uh, and, uh, and coming movement. I say from immemorial, immemorial times. Barcelona, you see Barcelona? Anywhere, any one of you who knows a bit of Arabic? What means barak in Arabic? It means benediction, bark. Yes, benediction. Barcelona, bark. There was a conqueror from Carthago, you remember, yesterday? Hamilcar Barca. Hamilcar Barca, he conquered most of northern Spain and even went into Italy. Now, look at his name. Amel Kher Barak. Hamilcar Barca. So, uh, I say that uh, uh, Northern African and even uh, Libyan influence was always present in this, the whole of the peninsula. It is very important to understand, you know, why we have this expansion, even today, of Spain and Portugal within Northern Africa and the, the, these islands. Uh, now, Something about Portuguese language. Portuguese was first spoken in the extreme northeast of the Iberian Peninsula. Though it is difficult to identify a language that was not yet written, it is supposed that its first form was very close to what is nowadays Galician. The regional language of the north, of the north is strip of uh, northeast, northeast strip of land of Spain. If you remember my map, uh, yes, you see, this is Galicia. It is bordered by the Basque country here. 
Now, Basque is a totally different language. It's nearer to Turk than to any known European language. It's very strange, we still do not know exactly. But it is widely spoken. One of my grandmothers, she knew Basque but would never speak any word because that was forbidden. Mm. Fascist governments. <laughs> My grandfather was Basque. Huh? My grandfather was Basque. Basque, yes, yes. So, bye. <laughs> bye in Basque means yes. Okay. It, it, it has a totally different root, you know. Bat, B, Iru, that is one, two, three. Hmm. So, uh, Galician was more or less isolated because there was a powerful uh, center here with Basque language. Then you had Arabic, so-called, and all the Roman languages also. And the mountain there, you know, the Pyrenees and the sea. And here also, different languages. So it was sort of isolated. But it had an opening, a very important opening on the sea. So uh, Portuguese not, is not very different, was not very different from Galician, that language, in the 13th, 14th century. We may say that its phonetics and choice of words must reflect Celtic pronunciation. Uh, yes, I was... Did you have enough time to read this? Yes? Because I went a bit, uh, I was a bit uh, quick. Mm. One thing is, one word you should remember is the word cantiga. Uh, thank you very much because this is as essential. Yeah. Not now, yeah, I, I don't switch it on now. Not now, later on. I'll do it later on. Not now, I'll do it later on. Because time will come, I know. Merci beaucoup, Sushan Sahib. <laughs> so, geographically and culturally, uh, what was to become Portuguese was dependent on, uh, um, on different layers, like a any language, by the way. But French influence came later, and one thing is certain, we had a stronger Celtic influence. Um, again, if you remember, if you look at my map of Spain, you see, like in France, in Brittany, we have a peninsula there in France that is right into the sea. So, uh, in the 9th and 10th in the course of 10th century mostly, we have a very strong Nordic population, Normans, North men, Normans, in Normandy now. Uh, they came and they came in a very frightful way. You know, they established themselves by killing and burning. Well, everybody did that after all, you know. That was common. So people had to run, many of them. And some of them, you know, they came here. And they were Celtic speaking, not Latin speaking, Celtic speaking people. And they 
Uh, it is one of the reasons for uh, the differentiation between local Latin, uh, that part, that strip of land, you know, and other Romance languages in the peninsula. As I say, it was already isolated. You had Basque, you had Proto-Spanish, if I may say, and Arabic, and here as well. So it had a development of its own, which uh, a fact that the Spanish people tend to negate, because this later on became part of Spain. So, of course, they Uh, uh, the early literature we have in Portuguese was influenced by, uh, excuse me, but I think you better follow me. You see what I mean? I might be not as good as whatever you could find on your phone. Yeah, but, yeah. Oh, no, she wasn't, uh, I don't know, but I don't know. But anyway, uh, there's a copyright on this as well. You should be aware of it. And uh, some text I will quote, I pirated them. So please do not photography them, because I'm not very proud of the fact that I pirated them although they are nearly 200 years old, more than 200 years old, but then. So uh, the first written state of language we have in Portuguese was called Cantigas. Now you must remember, you must remember uh, when we saw the first verses of Virgil, Arma virumque cano. Cano, canere, to sing. Cantus in later Latin means a song. And canticum is also a con. Cantiga is bigger. Hmm? Cantiga is the Portuguese version of canticum, Latin, a song. And it would mean a short poem. And, and, and that was sung, you know, from one castle to another. Geograph geographically, and Galicia was depending on its sea commerce, and ethnically, we can suppose that the local Latin language, already influenced by Iberian substrate, had a more characteristic and lexical influence with the further coming of Celtic people around 10th century AD who were flying from Viking invasions in Northern Europe and elsewhere. So if we try to characterize, characterize early form of Portuguese, not very different from Galician in 13th, 14th century, we may say that its phonetics, choice of words, must reflect Celtic pronunciation of Latin and also Provencal, Occitan. That was, uh, oh my God, why do we have this? Bon chal. It's, oh, chup. That is, thank you for telling me. So, uh, you see, uh, if you remember, coming back to my map, here, we have a very strong language uh, that has its apex in Aquitania. Aquitania is this part of southern France. 
And uh, the, that language is sometimes called Provencal. Now we call it Occitan. Because in France we had two main traditions, a northern one and a southern one. And the word to say yes in northern French was to, used to be oui. And in, uh, in southern part it used to be oc. Ok. From the Latin oc ok ille. This is it. So Occitan was the southern uh, languages. And they developed literature, courtly literature, much, much earlier than the North. And of course, they did influence um, the whole Iberian Peninsula at a very early stage. For example, you know, uh, Catalan used to be called Limosi. Limosi is from Limoges, from a French town. And French, uh, no, Occitan literature had a great influence on Portuguese literature, more than on Spanish literature, which uh, maturates much later, by the way. Huh? Occitan. Uh, from 11th century, we have uh, already a solid corpus. Mm -hmm. And that is important even in the daily speech for one simple reason, that southern French people did participate in the wars against the Arab-dominated kingdom. So, you know, along with them, they brought some part of languages. In any case, whatever we have of early written contigas, 14th century, while Latin was still the language of the church and administration, administration denotes a strong influence of Provencal troubadours. Uh, now, trovere in Latin, it is from trop, Greek, it means to find a rhyme, to find a rhythm, to compose. Troubadour in French, in Occitan, means the composer, the finder, the one who finds something. In French, we have trouver, to find. And in English, you have, for example, treasure, trove, finding treasure. Hmm? To, to discover, to compose. Troubadours, court poets traveling from one medieval princely court to another. They came to what was to be Portugal, they came earlier than in uh, the other part of Spain, of uh, the Iberian Peninsula, I should say. The Portuguese early medieval kingdom developed very early in 12th, 13th century from north to south. <coughs> now again my map, from north to south, you see, Confr uh, along the Atlantic coast, confronted with local Muslim Arab Berber kingdoms, so we know now what is a Berber, and with, confronted with rival Spanish Christian Castilian power, they were not yet Spanish, they were Castilian, just like Castilian language, later known as Spanish, it integrated quite a significant number of common Arabic words and Berber words in daily life, and sometimes different ones compared to Spanish. For example, Alfayat. Now, Alfayat is very different from modern Spanish, Tejero, Taylor, Tejero. 
uh, uh, while uh, Teixeiro, a weaver, presently survives also as a family name in Portugal, Teixeira, for example. But nobody says Teixeiro anymore. They say Alfaya in modern Portuguese. So you see, differentiation of languages is something very important in Romance languages dominion as well as else, anywhere else, by the way. And uh, it has a political motive since they, they conquered with great difficulties uh, the whole French, Atlantic French. You see, this part. In 13th century, they were already around here. And this province, they conquered very late, including Lisbon. Now, Lisbon is supposedly founded by Ulysses. Remember? Ulysses Porna. <laughs> yes. And why, why you be Lisbon? Why you be? Somebody has a key? No? Oh, oh. Please help me. Hello? Yes, Technician. Yes. Hello, sir. Just help me. I don't want to. Yes. Okay. Back pocket? No. no. Here. In here. Yes, thank you. Now, to this day, this province is called Algarve, Arabic, Algarve, the West. Hmm? To this day. So the Portuguese early medieval kingdom developed very early, 12th to 13th century, from north to south along Atlantic coast confronted with the local Muslim Arab Berber kingdoms and with rival Christian or uh, Castilian power, just like Castilian language, later known as Spanish, it integrated quite a significant number of common Arabic words in daily life and sometimes very different ones compared to Spanish, Alfayat, opposed, opposed to Spanish, Tejero, Taylor, while Teixeiru, a weaver, presently survives also as a family name, Teixeira. Uh, and you see a toponymy, names of places. In the whole peninsula is very much influenced by Arabic. This um, uh, there is a, a, f uh, a big, big river, the Tagus. It goes like that, like that, like that, that up to Lisbon. Now, Tagus is probably uh, a name that is back to Celtic tradition. But other big rivers, all, they all have Arabic names. For example, here, the Guadalquivir. Wadi al-Kabir, the great river, Wadi al-Kabir, a great river. And you must have heard of Guadalupe, Guadalupe, no? Guadalupe, an island in America. Hmm? That is Wadi al-Hub, the valley of love. And in the Christian tradition of uh, Iberia, of the whole Iberia, there is a special incarnation of Virgin Mary, which is, who, she is called Nuestra Señora of de Guadalupe. And Guadalupe is a name for girls. 
and that is still the Arabic Wadi Al Hub, the river of love. What a beautiful name, by the way. If I am saying all these things, it's because now I have to uh, Asinus Doctum Cum Libro. The donkey is a great scholar, provided he has a book. Asinus Doctus Cum Libro. Hmm? Uh, I would I would love to uh, just give two examples, sentences in Portuguese and in Spanish. By the way, this is a personal difficulty because when I was very young, Portuguese was compulsory along with Spanish. And there was a great danger of mixing them up. You'll see. Uh, esta manhã estou a trabalhar. This morning I am working. Esta manhã estou trabalhando. So, esta manhã, Latin matina, esta manhã, you have, you, and you hear, you have nasal sounds that are not in Spanish. Esta manhã, manhã. Like in Hindi, so many nasal A ah in Hindi. Bant, Chand, Manyang. Esta Manyang. Esta is this. Close to Spanish, Esta Manyana. Esta. Hmm? That is a, a Latin demonstrative. And uh, Isto uh, a trabalhar. I am working. Literally, I am at to work. I am to work. In Spanish, estoy trabajando. Me cam carrahum. In Spanish, you have a progressive tense. That is, the action is in a successive uh, state of work. Hmm? That it is developing. In Portuguese, like in French, you have none of it. There is no notion of progressive tense in Portuguese, like in French. In French we say, je suis en train de travailler, I am in the business of going to work, which is very clumsy compared to Spanish or Hindi. I don't know about southern, uh, southern uh, Indian languages at all. I'm sorry for that. But Sanskrit has the same tendency. Uh, of, uh, Sanskrit does not have a progressive. No, it does not. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm glad for the Portuguese people. <laughs> there, there are precedents. <laughs> I'm glad for the French also. It, 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 is, it is there. It is there. Yes, yes, yes. You see, these are, uh, it's an important marking difference. If I say in Portuguese, estou trabalhando, people will look at me. What kind of Portuguese is he speaking? <laughs> they will understand, but they will laugh at it. You know, bad. It's bad. And uh, there is also another. Uh, verbal difference, which is very important if you are ever to understand a bit of Portuguese. It is Portuguese has maintained plus quam perfect, like I had worked. In one word, trabalhara, trabalhara, which is I had worked without any auxiliary, you see? Directly uh, uh, from Latin, by the way. Spanish has a tendency, modern Spanish has a tendency to drop it.
and so on. So the main differences between Spanish and Portuguese are phonetics. Spanish has Z like Tamil for example. Uh, sp sorry, Portuguese has Z, Spanish has no Z. Z. Spanish has interdental just like English. Th in Spanish. In Spaniard, in, in, in Spanish from Spain, it's different in South America. And Portuguese has no interdental at all. For example, the word zero in Spanish is cero, cero. In Portuguese, zero. Yes. Ah, yes. They don't have. They don't have interdental. I know that. I know that. I know that. Uh, so you are a friend of Mafalda. Yeah. So are my granddaughters. You know, <laughs> I taught them Maf Mafalda. <laughs> so uh, Spanish has also another thing that Portuguese has not anymore is G, like tejera, tejero, like uh, um, I, I was about to say a bad word, sorry. <laughs> well, let us say an insult, carajo. Carajo is a very bad name. Hmm? Portuguese caralho. Hmm? Cangrejo. A crab in Portuguese, a crab. You know the sea, seafood. The a crab. Well, for us it is seafood. <laughs> the the crab, cangrejo, español, cangrejo. And this is a very modern thing in Spanish. It started in 17th century, not before. It is not from Arabic, though it could have been. But it is not. It came through German influence, through Dutch influence, during the, uh, the reign of uh, Carlos V, Carlos I, Charles V, Emperor of Germany and Spain and the whole rest of the world. Hmm? So they had so many soldiers coming from what is now Netherlands and uh, uh, Germany, and that gave uh, peculiar, peculiar sounds. Now, it could be, it could be, that it might have coincided with relics of Arabic also, because Arabic has also th and kh. It might have mixed, I don't know. It's, we don't have any proof of it. All we know is from end of 16th century onwards, there is a differentiation between Portuguese and Spanish. In uh, 1574, uh, Portuguese loses its independence for 60 years, and for 60 years, official language was Spanish, but that reinforced the national consciousness of Portuguese-speaking people. Others would say, no, no, we are Spanish-speaking, you know. It's, and Camões did sense that kind of threat, you know, during his life, the Spanish threat was very much present. He died the very day when the Spanish uh, armies were crossing the frontier to invade Portugal again. So you should be aware of that because it is a very powerful incentive for Camões to write his epics. He wanted to please the last uh, Portuguese dynasty in front of the 
Spanish threat. Now, both Spanish and Portuguese power, Portuguese power, and perhaps more the Portuguese than the Spanish, uh, contrary to what they might say today, but they cannot, you know, deny history. They included forcefully massive of Berber and Arabic speaking people for a very simple reason. They needed them. They were the, the, the laborers. And, you know, one would think that, oh no, we have very little Arabic influence here. No, no. On the contrary, the conquerors, you know, here as well, when they would come to South, they would deport many people as slaves to the North to replace those who, had, who were going South. Now, the Catalan are very proud of their own language. And they have, for example, one word for them, which is a symbolic word, which does not exist in any other Spanish language. Rambla. Rambla means a promenade along, and the coast along the sea. You should not tell them. It is from the Arabic. Ramla, that means the sand, the sand. But do not tell them. <laughs> you know, in uh, Perpignan, Perpignan is there. It is a former Spanish town that Louis XIV conquered, annexed, better say. So they are very much clinging to their Catalan language nowadays. They say, oh, it has been suppressed, it should come back. They started taking off the name of streets in French and they put Ramla, this, Rambla, this, that, you know, not knowing that they were putting an Arabic word. And this should be, uh, you know, it, it is a very important thing because it explains how easily the Portuguese so-called discoverers, they discovered nothing, <laughs> so-called, say, conqueror, yes, uh, which they had some facilities and abilities because the Portuguese and Spanish kingdoms, but more the Portuguese, more so, they integrated a very powerful Jewish minority. And they integrated so many soldiers from Northern Africa, you know. Because uh, Ceuta and Tanger, they are now Spanish towns in Africa, still. You know, hard dying uh, colonialism. But Ceuta, Ceuta was first Portuguese before of being uh, uh, Spanish. And there was such an easy communication and the Portuguese expansion was eased by uh, their Arabic speaking navigators who were supposedly Portuguese, hastily converted, you know. You know what they used to do? Very simple. In a conquered town, they would assemble people, preferably rich people take a branch of tree, put it into supposed holy water, shoom, shoom. you are Christian now. <laughs> Many people wouldn't understand, they wouldn't even know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you see, it was mass baptism because the church was wanted it. The the Portuguese kingdom, they, they wouldn't care because they, was, they were needing those people, whoever they was, whoever they were. So that explains a few, few facts. 
Now coming to the Jewish community, which was very, very strong, one has to know that in Spain, like in Portugal, they were specialized in three languages, Latin, Arabic, and Hebrew. But their language, their cultural language, to this day, to this day in Northern Africa, was Arabic and nothing else. So they were needed. Uh, Jews in uh, medieval Europe were forbidden to possess any land because of the stand of Catholic Church on the supposed Holy Land. You see, they had difficulties in maintaining a Christian kingdom in Palestine and so they did not want any Jewish community to own land in Europe. So, they, uh, so the, the Portuguese were using the Jewish community like the Spaniards did also, but the Portuguese, I would say, in a better way. They suppressed them at times, but not as much as the Spaniards did. And they used their profound knowledge of Arabic. And besides, you see, those Jews were great uh, connoisseurs of Arabic and Greek. Because through Arabic literature, we had so many texts translated from Greek, you should know that the Catholic Church in the medieval times was forbidding the use of Greek. Because that was Byzantinium, that was Constantinople, supposedly. Though they were Latin also, but you know, Greek was their Bible, so Greek Bible, Greek text, you know, were forcefully ignored in medieval Europe. For example, in many manuscripts, early Latin manuscripts, sometimes we have a Latin sentence that says, Graecum non legitur. Greek is not to be read. <laughs> so they would, they would just ignore the Greek, the Greek sentence while translating a, a Latin text. The Arabics, the Arabs had no such a prohibition. Neither had the uh, Hebrew speaking people. And uh, you see, through them, the Portuguese crown had knowledge of Greek geography, of Arabic geography, and that facilitated a lot their uh, uh, navigation. You see, uh, the uh, Arab navigation was very, very important. important. I wish I had a map here to show you. But Arab navigation and Indian navigation, you see, uh, Indo-Persian navigation, from 11th century onwards, Persian navigation supersedes Arab navigation, up to China, up to China. And from 16th century, because of uh, mainly because of superior artillery and stronger ships, the Portuguese, they supersede for a moment Arab and Persian navigation. But with great difficulties. They could never really replace Persian and Indo-Persian navigation. They had to compromise most of the time. Though they do not say, but they had to. They had to. So, uh, Camoens is a witness of that. He's a witness of that. Now, a few words about his life. Now, I'm quoting in Portuguese, but rest assured, I'm going to read it in French, in English. Hmm? So, 
This is a short note about the, you see, uh, this work, and uh, it is printed in Paris, but by a Portuguese uh, very good uh, philologist at the end of 19th century. And this is what he says while publishing the text of uh, the Uslusiades. Procurei além disso. I tried to normalize uh, the strange name that I found in the Lusiadas. See? So he says, uh, I wrote Marsilia, Marsilia, the French port, hmm? a Greek port, by the way. I, uh, I am. Uh, I am uh, also not confusing Massilia and the Greek port, French now, Marseille, with Massilia in Libya. Hmm? And I'm trying to explain who is Thetis, the spouse, the wife of Neptune. Here is slightly wrong, but it doesn't matter. And uh, the daughter of Nereus, Nereus, his another name of Okeanos, the god of sea. Hmm? So he says that he had to adapt words from Greek and Latin mythology that people in 19th century could not read easily. Now, the family of Camoens is from Galicia, that is, if you remember my map, huh? that string of land in extreme northeast Spain, that is now Span, Spa, Spain, not anymore Portugal. Portugal. So, Camoens was from a family from that part, that we know. And it explains also his form of language. He was supposedly from a noble family, supposedly, because I don't agree what he says, actually. Uh, for example, the Macedus, Macedus from Santarin, they were a Jewish family, but that he doesn't know. Macedos are just like Masia, who is Messiah. So, um, I would love to find a text, I have yet to find it, that would somehow relate Camoens with the knowing of, uh, I mean, his family with some knowledge of Arabic. Uh, I'll tell, tell you why. Now, when he was a young man, he was in his 20, you know, in, in 1525, he had a trouble in Lisbon. And I shall explain it. Because Portuguese historians of those days, and even now, they are not clear about it. It is somehow embarrassing. You know, young Camões, he crossed a religious procession, a Lent procession, we are now in Lent times, hmm? a religious procession about, uh, you know, mm, before the celebration of the death of Christ. So there was a huge procession and people had to, you know, cross themselves and take off their hat. Camoens did not just as a provocation, say the historians. And because of that, he was sent to prison and sent away from Lisbon. He had been a student educated in, in the newest University of Portugal, but in spite of that, the court was not pleased. You know, you don't joke with that. 
especially at a time that when in Lisbon they still had a very powerful community of recently converted people, nilly willy converted, we call them conversos, converts. And you see, the Inquisition was starting. In 1525, it is still early for the Inquisition to come full force in Portugal. It's not before 1535. But still, the church was invigilating uh, in, and uh, he was sent to exile in northern Portugal somewhere where he would not be heard of. And then, there, you know, he was bored, he started writing poetry. But what kind of poetry? He was in love with the lady of the court. And that was forbidden, of course, because he was of low grade, you know. How could he pretend to court Donia Ataide, who was related to the king's family? But when he came back to Lisbon, he produced some poems dedicated to her. And for that, he had a second exile. Uh, I, almost as important, with prison also, you know. Uh, because, uh, you know, one thing was to insult the Catholic religion or the church. Another thing was to so-called insult the royal family. I mean, that was unbearable. And now he was in a mess. So what did he do? He pleaded to enlist for Northern Africa and go and fight there. Uh, but before leaving Africa, he uh, joined the forces, the, uh, the sailors and the forces, Portuguese forces, who were going to Africa. He joined them for a while. Now, here I have some doubts, because, you see, why should he be accepted with a command, with a command within those forces while he was officially disgraced? I suspect that he was from a family that had somehow still some knowledge of Arabic. Otherwise, he would not have been so easily enlisted as a captain. Yeah. Hmm? Now, in that, in a battle in Ceuta, in northern Africa, almost touching to Spain, he lost one eye. And that gave him some, you know, respect. Yes, he's a martyr of the faith which he was not at all. He was there to make money. Yeah. And, and to get a command, you know, if you get a command, okay. of course you have spoils, you know, respectability. But losing one eye added to his personal prestige. And after that, he was a able to enlist himself for India. Five years later, in 1550, he embarks for India with some, you know, personal glory. So he is somebody now. And his former commander, <coughs> Noronia, in Northern Africa, was also his commander going to Goa. Now, in 1550, it is already 40 years that Goa is definitively conquered, 1510, over the, over, the, over the Indian local power. So, he comes to uh, 
he comes to India, but then again he becomes a troublesome person. What did he? You know, uh, Noronia, his commander, the vice king, was called back to Portuguese. So he lost his protector. And the new uh, governor or vice king was a man who would like very much, you know, grand festivals, etc., and comedy, and, and, and wasting money also, instead of sending money back to the king. So, uh, young Camoes did not like him at all because he was, uh, he, he was his friend's enemy and also because he had an attitude, attitude that he would not like. And uh, you have to know that in those days, Camões was not the only one to be critical of Portuguese power in Asia. There was another uh, Portuguese writer, Diogo do Cautu, who wrote a long Philips, you know, critic, a dialogue, but it was in form of a dialogue, but it was a hard criticism of Portuguese power in India, o soldado practico, o soldado practico, and that was a satire of the Portuguese who, we, who would make themselves rich on the expenses of the crown in Asia. So, uh, Camões was very much influenced by the soldado practico, Pratico, it is there. O soldado pratico de Diogo do Cauto. Written in the 1550, something like that. Hmm? And he saw the manuscripts of it. He was impressed. And himself, he wrote a comedy that was also a satire of the Portuguese court in Lisboa. In, sorry, in Goa. And that was another big problem for him because, you see, this satire, he had it played as a comedy in front of the vice king. He was very, uh, he was a, a daredevil. So again he was exiled, guess where? In China, in Macau, far, far away so that he wouldn't be heard of. <laughs> he was given, given a cushy job because after all he still had friends, you know. He couldn't be uh, put straight into jail. He was later on. But on the beginning he was given a cushy job that was looking after the bequeath uh, of the dead people, the dead Portuguese, looking after the money of the dead Portugal, Portuguese people. That was a very cushy job and a profitable one, <laughs> of course. But most of the time he was free to write poetry and then he knew that he had many things to be pardoned. So he started writing his epics, Os Lusiadas, supposedly based on the history of Luzu, L-U-S-O. Now, this is another point of Portuguese. Final O is always pronounced U, just to make a difference from, from Spanish. Spanish would be Luzo, Portuguese Luzu. Hmm? That's it. <laughs> so, uh, supposedly there was a founder of Lusitania. In uh, Roman times, what is now Portugal, 
was called Lusitania. Supposedly from some hero, Luzu, you know, Luzus. Nobody heard about it before. So he took that from Lusitania, he took Luzu and made it just like Aeneas. Hence the Lusiadas. Hence this strange plural, us is the feminine, is the masculine article. Normally, ash, Lusiadas, should be feminine. But just to ape Greek, he made it masculine. See, he, he had some knowledge of, uh, he had a great knowledge of Latin and perhaps some knowledge of Greek, perhaps. So, because of this satire that he had written while being in Goa, he was exiled for, I think, nearly eight years in Macau. And uh, then he was allowed to come back to Goa, but then again he had trouble because he had made so much of money, you know. And that was suspicious, though they had a trial against him. And then, you see, they also picked up another problem. Uh, has anybody of you heard of Garcia da Horta? Garcia? Excuse me, I must drink a bit. Now, I wish I had a blackboard. Oh! Oh! Yes! Pen kaha hai? Thank you. In Spanish, they have an accent here. Not in Portuguese. Da Orta. Ah. Colloquio das simples. Now this is a very, very, it's around 1556, something like that. I'm not, I don't remember well the, the date, but more or less. Garcia da Horta, Garcia is just a common Iberian name. Da Horta means from the garden. And he was a Jew not even converted, by the way, with his sister, he had come to India with the mission of writing a book about plants in India. You should remember that spices, namely black pepper, was a very strong motive for commercing with Asia. The Portuguese colonizers, they became filthy rich because of the trade of spices, taken from the Arabs, by the way. And uh, so the spice trade was very, very important. And for that, the Portuguese power, he needed, uh, the Portuguese power needed people like him he was a great scholar. He was a Jew. He knew Arabic perfectly. He knew Latin perfectly. He knew Hebrew perfectly. And he had been able to read the books in Arabic that were describing the fauna and flower and, and flora of India. Hmm? 
much before the Europeans, by the way. So, uh, even if those books were not very accurate, but Garcia da Horta was a very valuable man. He observed, you see, on site, in situ, he observed the plants and said, oh, this is like this, this is like that, and the Latin name should be this, the Arabic name should be this, and he asked people from the local names also. And he wrote a book, Colloquio da Simples, the book of the simples. Now, simples is a direct translation of Arabic mufurdat. Fard in Arabic means unique. Mufurdat is the, uh, the spectrum of unique plants to cure, unique medicinal plant, the simplest. Mufurdat. So, uh, colloquium uh, Colloquio da Simples was a, a very important book printed in Goa, written and printed in Goa. This is very important. It is the first ever, first ever work of science printed in, uh, in Portuguese in, in the whole of Asia and also one of the first ever book printed in Portuguese also. And very useful for the Portuguese power, which was based on the trade of spices. Now it is called colloquio, that means dialogue, cum loquere in Latin, to speak together. Hmm? And that is again from Arabic mukalima, dialogue. So uh, it is in form of dialogue, just like the practical soldier, u, pract u soldado pratico, uh, the form is a dialogue, a bit like a comedy. You have one person who is quite ignorant asking another person who is a scholar. So that was a vivid way of presenting science with drawings as also, like the Arabs would do. So the colloquio was a very important thing and the Portuguese power used that thing, you know. That for them it became a very important tool uh, of knowledge to identify spices to commercialize them, etc. So far, so good. Uh, 15, 35, 15, 50, somewhere, the, uh, uh, the Spanish and Portuguese uh, Inquisition com comes with full force, even in India. Do you know what happened? Uh, he had just died around, the, around that, that date. So they took his body out of the grave while it was considered as a monument by the Portuguese themselves. But just because he was of a Jew. And they burnt the corpse and they burnt his surviving sister, who had accompanied him in India. The sister was very important in writing the book also, which is a very unusual thing. She was burnt alive. So, you, you see the reaction. Now, Camoes, what did he do before that? Much before that. He sensed that the colloquio 
was a very, very important book. And he wrote a preface for it. And he wrote a small essay for praising it. In those days, the vice king and the king, they were very much happy about it. But later on, with the coming of the Inquisition, they said, oh, this Camoys, he was favoring a Jew? He was a friend of a Jew? Again to jail. And this time, hard jail. And he pleaded for a long time to be allowed to go back to uh, Portugal. For that, he had to give back all his money and he was boarded on a ship. Uh, on the way to Africa, they had a ship wrecked. And legend has it that he had the Lusiadas in one hand and was swimming with the other hand. <laughs> and came back naked, but with the Lusiadas. <laughs> So this is a bit of a legend, but it has some truth. Because you see, a shipwreck in those days was no joke. And again, he had to borrow money to be able to go back to Portugal. And then he went to the king. The king was a new one and not very much favoring the church. So he went to him and said, look, I have written something in glory of your reign. Would you, would you lead it? Would you read it? Would you like? So he presented it to the king and asking in favor, please get me out of jail, so give me a small pension. So he was given a small pension, by the way. And uh, not fully appreciated because the church was still there. And in some parts of the Lusiadas, now going to the crux of it, the, the Lusiadas has two main parts, just like um, um, uh, uh, Iliad and Odysseus. You see, the first part is retelling the whole story of the Portuguese wars against the Moors, the Arabs, and against uh, the other Spanish powers. So there is a whole epic part that is devoted to the history of Portugal. And the second part is the so-called discoveries of Asia and India. Now, Portuguese people would say as Indies. As Indies, the Indies, it would come from what is nowadays Madagascar up to China. This was as Indies, you know. <laughs> Actually, it was a string of ports, uh, string of port of calls, of trading centers, not always in firm Portuguese hand. That is another story. But theoretically, the king of Portugal was the king of the seas. He was another Neptune. Yeah. You know? So, uh, uh, Camões worked deeply on that. So he wrote the story, first the story of Luzu, the founder of Portugal, and the Portuguese dynasties, choosing some characters, like uh, Homer and Virgil would have done, because Virgil also retraced Roman history, so he would retrace Portuguese history, Portuguese history. And then the second part is uh, the hero is Vasco da Gama, who was the Portuguese navigator and conqueror and the, in the very late uh, 15th century and early 16th century. So Vasco da Gama is his second hero with the Arab pilot who is supposed to be a villain, by the way. 
you know, a traitor somewhere. Some, but he, uh, he's not at ease at all with it because he knows that uh, without him, nothing would have uh, happened. So he doesn't condemn him totally. And more so, uh, yeah. Yeah, but you see, it is blocked. It is blocked, and then I'll uh, I'll wait for a moment. Uh, now, if you can try to, you know, switch it off, and uh, while I talk, you 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 know how to manage this. You don't. Yeah. Yes. I you mean, know. I manage. Yeah. So I think while you, you, you quit this application, no, 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 oh no, 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 I, I have to do it. Um, I have to do it. Because... Oh, really? no, I, no, I, no, you, yes. Yeah, yes. The whole thing is in French. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, we, we. Uh, okay. Uh, can we have a pause, perhaps? Yes. I hope I was clear enough. Yes. Was I? Yes. Because, uh, you know, times. Ah. I understand, yeah. Is it better like this, perhaps? Yes. There are so many things we do not know about the life of um, of Camões. One thing is certain: he had several times in prison, either in China, either in Goa, either in Lisbon, and all these troubles were linked with supposedly. Uh, bad management of the king's money, supposedly, but mainly with his uh, audacious writings, whether it would be falling in love with a lady from the court, whether it would be mocking the Portuguese governor, whether it would be his friendship with the famous great biologist Garcia da Horta, who was a Jew. And uh, by the way, this is the saddest story I ever heard about Portuguese domination in Asia. Uh, yeah, Garcia da Horta. Garcia da Horta. His family is still there in Amsterdam. We have a very famous architect who is called Horta, who was from that very family. Nowadays, even nowadays. And Horta was a great, I mean, uh, not the present Horta family, but the 1920s. Hortas, they were great architects of Art Nouveau. Beautiful architecture, by the way. So, uh, you see, if I say this, it is because one cannot ignore the connection that uh, Camões must have had with the Oriental world 
even going, before going to India. I'm quite sure of it. It is no coincidence. And the royalty, the court, they must have been aware of it. You have to know that for a very long time, and Vasco da Gama was one of them, young people, preferably those who might have known Arabic, you know, those people were gathered in special courts, in special schools, in Portugal court, in, uh, you know, the Spaniards wouldn't do that, but the Portuguese did that. Th they would have sons of former um, Berbers, Arab or Jews, especially the rich ones, they would, they would have them in special schools, hastily baptized, well, that's it, okay? But those people, they knew that they had a rich background and they were used by the crown. And I suppose Camões was one of them, though it is not stated anywhere. But we have, you see, all his biographers says that, they say that his family was not very rich, but he was allowed to go to the biggest uh, university of his times, Coimbra. How come? He was taken into the school, special school of the court for Africa and Asia. How come? So he must have had some background. And that would explain also his friendship with uh, uh, Garcia da Horta and also with Diogo do Cauto. Now, a word about Diogo do Cauto. Diogo do Cauto was a Portuguese writer, a scrivan, a, a kind of notary. He was sent to Asia, mostly Goa, for writing and uh, writing history of discoveries and also, uh, you know, giving accounts of the riches of the country. Hmm? So it would go together. But Diogo do Cauto, he had a very critical mind, as I told you. He wrote. Uh, um, he wrote a very strict criticism of uh, the Portuguese power in the 1550. In Goa. In Goa and, and, and somewhere else also, in Africa as well. So his, uh, uh, his dialogues, his dialogues of the practical soldier is uh, actually a strong criticism not yet in the form of epics. But look, it's a former soldier that speaks. So we are already almost in the epic genre, not very far from, except that all the way it is very critical. It uh, narrates uh, historical fact, yes, but with a very uh, Pudgy tone, you know. Uh, so we do have some decent voices in Portugal very early, and even in the um, in the uh, in the Lusiades, we have a long book you know, a long song by an old man, supposedly in Africa, you see, he talks to Vasco da Gama. He is called Uvelio do Restelo. And he lectures him. In, he says, oh, what are you going so far of Portugal? What are you going to do there? Well, my kingdom is at risk. 
Well, we have the, the Spanish at our gates. You depopulate Portugal, Portugal of his best soldiers to go to Asia? You know, you fragilize the kingdom with those non-finishing conquests? That is in the Lusiadas. Quite surprising. You see, in spite of all the compliments he gives to the king, he allows himself a long para of criticism. The king did not mind because that was accusing a previous dynasty. So, in a way, the king was happy, saying that the, today's difficulties, they are not mine. You know, it is my ancestors, I mean, the other dynasty that, that mismanaged. So, he would agree with the criticism of the value du reste So, the old man lecturing Vasco da Gama before he reaches Asia and saying, okay, you have some parts of Africa. So far, so good. Don't go any further. You are wasting your money. You are wasting the riches of Portugal. And above all, you are giving way to the Spaniards. And this is what happened. And uh, uh, Don Juan Terceiro, King John III, who was there in the 1570s, agreed to that because he knew the big threat that was coming. Uh, yeah, yes. And uh, at the same time, uh, um, what was his name? Um, sorry. In the Lusiadas, at the same time, Camoens has a subtle criticism of Portuguese imp imperialism. You know, especially because he was so angry at the church persecuting his friends. And his own persecution, you know, he's going to jail, etc. So he has a bit of vengeance in the discourses. Mm. It is called value do restealo. It is a part of Lisbon. Restealo. So, who value the ancient man from the restealo. Who value the restealo. And that is the important critical part of the Lusiadas, who are supposed to be a long epic poem glorifying the, uh, sto the history of Portugal and glorifying um, the, the conquest, etc. So, uh, one should not think that uh, it is all along a compliment. There was some criticism into it. And Camões had very good reasons for that. So, in Spanish, it would be el viejo del restelo. Value, viejo. Lieu, je. Now, this is a 19th century portrait of Camões. You see? Uh, his represented like that, so that you might not see okay. the lacking eye. <laughs> yes. And this is supposed to be the remnants of Macau Fort. With this part, there is a cave where supposedly, supposedly, Camões retired in a cave to write his, to finish his poem. Now this is very strange, you see. The man in the cave. It is a myth that goes back to Greek philosophy. 
Plato, yes? The man who comes out of the yeah. cave with revelation. <laughs> See? Camus himself, you know, uh, he, he let it be known. Oh yes, I spent very hard times. I spent eight years in a cave. That was not true at all. But, you know. <laughs> and uh, in 19th century, in Macao, that was still Portuguese, uh, they would show the cave. <laughs> and here, he's, you know, supposedly in exile. See? He's somewhere in Asia, in exile, and writing. But part of his work is, you know, in a bad shape. And you have a sword here. An allusion to his being a soldier before. Now, this is the cave. I don't, uh, it's not, not very precise. And this, I do not know if you can see, can, but some of it you can see. No, I'm not talking of the text, not at all. I'm not bothered with the text. I'm bothered with the illustration. Now, you remember the lessons about Greek mythology? Who's that? Whose bird? Zeus. 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 Yes. Uh, yeah, well. Whose bird? Athens. Athens. Athenai. Mm. Whose helmet? Uh, Athena. Athena. Yes. Again. Now, whose shield? Athena. 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 Again. Quiver. Cupids, but it could be Apollo as well, you know, the god of poetry. A flute, this is a flute, and this is grapes, this is Bacchus. Bacchus, why the hell would they have Bacchus? I'll tell you later. Yes, and also Bacchus is supposed to be the devil. Oh. But you see, uh, Bacchus does intervene in the story of the Lusiadas in Asia. Bacchus is Islam also. But uh, uh, in 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 the poem, we do have passages that present sympathetic Muslim powers. Very strange. Well, officially, it should be, I mean, the conquest of Asia should officially should be a prolongation of the Crusades. Yeah. Officially. Yeah. Not at all. Not really, I would say. So, here, I don't know if you can see, it's a peacock. Yes, we are, you know, Jupiter is there. So, this Caduceus, the god of travelers, because, well, they do travel, don't they? And this is an allusion to Garcia da Horta oh, yeah. with the pharmacopoeia. Yeah. You know, the, the venom, venom is good for the healers. So, this is no coincidence that we have such a decoration even as late as 19th century because the scholar who prepared that edition he knew all about. What is that? 
Yes? And what is this scene about? Venus? Yes? And they are discussing whether Enya should uh, live or not. Uh, yes, and wh wh who is that? That is Hera. No. With the pine. Okay, uh, yeah. The pine uh, staff? Uh, it's Dionysus. Oh, Bacchus. Yeah, yeah. It's Bacchus. Yeah. You know the enemies? Yeah. She is pleading in favor of the Greeks. The Portuguese against the Oriental represented by Bacchus and here you have the supreme god Zeus the god of the Jews also well you know so it is no coincidence at all that this late 19th century edition of uh, the Lusiadas, printed in Paris, by the way, because in, uh, in Portugal, uh, in late 19th century, Portugal had become a republic and was somehow not at ease, you know, with Camões. So this was the Council of the Gods deciding upon the fate of the humans. We are in Homer, we are in Virgil, and we are in Lusiadas as well. Because in Lusiadas, we also have a kind of council of gods, deciding upon the tempest, upon the, uh, the fate of the, of the Portuguese fleet, etc. Hmm? So you see, the link is obvious and uh, of course uh, excuse me I need to drink rest assured this is only tea yes <laughs> yes now, just while I drink, have a look at this. I want some remarks about that lamp. I want some remarks about this boat. I want some remarks about the, the whole picture. What do you see in the background? What do you see in the foreground? Now, uh, this is called the Visita do Rei de Belinde a Game. In Portuguese, the A, contrary to Spanish, Spanish would be Visita. Visita. Portuguese, Visite. See, the A is very much uh, diminished, if I may say. And de, de is not de in Spanish. A gamma, 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 not gamma, gamma, gamma. So the reign, the king of Belinda, supposed to be an Indian king and a Muslim one, by the way, is visiting the Portuguese commander, Vasco da Gama, here. In the background, you have the ships. And he takes what we call in Portuguese batel, a small ship. Look at this. What is it? No, this. This is obviously an Indian boat with the Hindu symbol, the, 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 the clock from the temple also, you know? This is an Indian boat. 
very much. Even the design is like Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Like that. This is a lotus. It could be also a tota, a parrot. Hmm? It could be. So, now, the Indian king. And uh, uh, his musicians. This is not very re realistic, but still, there is a whole passion uh, a whole passage uh, about the music. Já no batel entrou o capitão, o rei que nos seus braços o levava, canto segundo, estensa cento, cento um. So uh, it is the second song and the uh, 1100th stanza. Now, a few words about the poetic composition. Uh, if I can have a stanza. Now, this I made a huge effort to translate it into English. I say a huge effort because I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't do it very often, I should say. As armas e os barões assinalados que da occidental praia lusitana por mares nunca de antes navegados passaram ainda além da taprobana em perigos e guerras esforçados mais do que prometia a força humana e entre gente remota edificaram Novo reino que tanto sublimaram. Now here you have a past perfect. Hmm? They had edificated in one word. Straight from Latin, by the way. This, the Spanish, does not use it anymore. Or in 16th century, yes, they would. Now very little. The Portuguese, they stick to it just because the Spanish don't. <laughs> we have our own verbs, our own conjugation, you see. Uh, now, in English, I had to translate it with a, just a preterit, embellished. But it would be, they had so much later embellished. If I wanted to have a word-to-word -word translation to translate the past participle, uh, the plusquam perfectu, plusquam perfect, the um, past of past. <laughs> now, the arms on those faithful warriors who from the occidental shores of Portugal by seas never before navigated, went of Toprobana far away. Uh, Toprobana is supposed to be Ceylon. Supposed to be. You know, uh, uh, Camões knew very much about it because he had been there. But he's using a, an old name so that the ordinary Portuguese people could just understand him. And it makes it more mysterious, you know. It makes it more grandiose. To Pravana, oof. Vukto kahan hoga? Where should that be? It was a real name. Yes, Ceylon it is. Ceylon is given Britannia. Yeah, yeah. It's still 
still know it. Perhaps, I don't know. I've never been in Sri Lanka. But anyway, anyway, that was translated first into Arabic. If I'm not wrong, in the original it's a P, not a B. So through Arabic, in Arabic we have no P. I shall give you another example of a supposed oriental word in Portuguese. Uh, well, you know potatoes? Hmm? Spanish patata? Tupi Guarani patata? Patata, tomate, patate, tomate, chocolate, all this is Tupi Guarani from Latin America. Now, why should it be patata in Spanish and batata with B in Portuguese? Because of Arabic influence. Very simple. Even as late as that, even 16th century, you know? <laughs> By the way, in French, patate is not the official word. It is somehow derogatory. Um, now, the arms and those faithful warriors, I hope it rings a bell. Arma virumque cano. It is exactly Virgil. I sing the warriors and the arms. You know? Yes, yes, yes. Now, see, uh, now he says. Uh, this is his purpose. We call it in Portuguese proposito. He states his purpose. And after the purpose, he will have what we call invocation. Because the poet first says, well, I shall talk about this and that. And now I'm, I'm, I'm asking for help from the muses. So now we are still in the purpose. As armas as barões as inalados, this we read, and also those kings of memory glorious, who faith and empire went on expanding, and Africa and Asia's devastating, abundant lands, and not forgetting those who from death went liberating, by their valiant deeds lest art of ability fail me, everywhere I shall go singing. So this is my own translation. As faithful as, uh, as I could. E também as memórias gloriosas daqueles reis que foram dilatando a fé o império, not the capitals, eh? a fé, the faith, o império e as terras viçosas de África e de Ásia andaram devastando e aqueles que por obras valerosas se vão da lei da morte libertando cantando espalharei por todas as partes se a tanto me ajudar o engenho e a arte. So, here we have a stanza. Let us come to the first one also. Now, we have Ek, do, tin, char, pan, che, sat, art. Art verses. One stanza is art verses. Here we have a totally different stylistic picture that was inherited from Italy. And stanza in Italy means a poem that stands by itself. Stanza, stare, to stand. And eight verses. Now, it is a bit difficult to understand the origins of the, of the whole of it. We know that it started in northern Italy, in, sorry, in southern Italy, and in Sicily. And 
a part of the stanza, there is also something that is very new, the rhyme. You see? Adush, Adush, Anna, Anna, Adush, Anna, Ang, Aram, Aram, which is called the rhyme. Now, originally, rhyme and rhythm was the same word. And rhyme is a new invention of Latin languages, perhaps taken from the court of Sicily, the Norman court of Sicily, who was, it was a bilingual court. It was Latin and Arabic, both. And it is believed, we don't know exactly, but it is believed that the rhymes is an invention of those Viking kings who were also Arabic speaking. They had taken off the uh, Arab kingdom of Sicily, but they didn't change a thing. They couldn't, by the way. So they kept the same poet, the same language, both. And they were not much bothered about Catholicism, you know. The Vikings, you know, they, 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 they had very doubtful religion as far as, as, far as Cath Catholicism was concerned. So what, all they cared about was riches and power and trade. So they kept the Arab people with them. And they mixed. Even today in Sicily, uh, you see, for example, the captain of a fishing boat, he, ha he has an Arabic term. Uh, I forgot the, uh, the one. Mm. Well, it will come back. But one thing is sure, that the sonnet, sonetto, you know, started in Sicily. The Spaniards, they came to Sicily in early 16th century. They conquered it and they were fascinated by this new poetry. Short verses, stanza, and then also this new model that you have one, four rhymes, uh, four verses, quatrains, one, uh, again four verses, twice four verses, and twice three verses. That is sonetto. In Italian, it means a little music. And a new one, by the way. And in that, you had new kind of stanzas, new kind of rhythm, you know. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. The Alexandrine, the twelve syllables. Said to be imitating Greek poetry of Alexandria. Said to be. We don't know exactly, but we know that the Arabs took it up. We know that the Italians took it up. We know that the 12 syllables verse was taken up also by the French, by the whole of Europe in 16th century, as well as the rhyme system. That was very new. You see, in, in Latin it is totally unknown. Mixing Arabic and who knows Hebrew as well, and who knows uh, Germanic influence, you know, we, we don't know exactly. All we know that it came out in the court of Sicily at the end of the uh, Viking, Viking kingdom, which was the, the Norman kingdom, which was also Arabic speaking kingdom, up to very late. Hmm? 
So we know because Spanish and Italian and Portuguese poets, they were there. Uh, the first official poet uh, in Spanish, uh, for, for as far as uh, Soneto is concerned, he was a soldier and was stationed in Sicily for a long time. And he was not alone. So, you see, anyway, uh, poetic forms, they do travel. And this system of 12 syllables and rhyme and the stanza, the eight verses syllables, the eight, eight verses stanza, that was uh, taken throughout in the, um, in the Lusiadas. See, you have to know that because that became a model. Uh, Ari, ke ora hai? Yes. Uh, I have again a problem because I made such a heavy uh, structure. You see, it is not manageable. Let me. it again. Mm. Oh, I just can't see it. Is this legible? Yeah. Yes. You see, it doesn't want. Uh, well, I shall try to explain uh, those stanzas in English because my machine is failing me. Uh, it does happen. So here there is a dialogue between the Indian Muslim king and Vasco da Gama. And the Muslim king said, you know, I heard of you people. You did not hear of me, but I heard of you people. I know. And uh, this is an historical fact. But uh, 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 Camões put it in a very sweet manner. He wants to give a, a picture of a peaceful meeting between the uh, Indian king and Vasco da Gama. Actually, we know through other chroniclers, through chroniclers, that sometimes, you see, the Portuguese, Vasco da Gama and others, they were surprised to meet people who would speak Portuñol, you know, between Spanish and Portuguese. Hmm? And those people were very good at Arabic also. They were the former Arabs and Jews expelled from Spain. And through the 
Turkish Empire that was just beginning now its expansion they had come to India because they were favoring the new trade between, between the Ottoman Empire and India. They were useful intermediaries. Yeah, but we hear of one um, instance of the Portuguese coming to Goa, Vasco de Gama, for example, and in, in the time of the, uh, of the king of Goa, before the conquest of Goa, so there is a supposedly Indian who comes up and he says to the Portuguese, you bad dogs, you son of dogs. He started like this. You tortured us. Do you think you're welcome here? So we have testimonies. Now, of course, uh, Camões, in his dialogue with the Indian king, he does not reproduce none of it. He makes it in a very peaceful one. So this is all for today. No? Thank you for your... Uh, we do have time for questions, if there is. Please do. Please do. Do you have any questions, comments, any specific thing you want to say? Mm -hmm. Any questions tomorrow also? Then we come to it. Yes. Now? Acha. Uh, the whole class, please, for the photograph. Huh? Dhoop me in the sunlight, if you can bear it. Tomorrow I'll carry on with it in the best way, I hope, uh, with a lighter program so that I don't have these troubles. Hmm? And I will talk about also a very recent Indian version of the Lusiadas in Portuguese, but written by a Hindu, and which is a very interesting comparison. Hmm?